everybody. Everybody, can you hear me? Okay, good. We like that. Um, welcome to Arcadia University. I'm Richard Torchia, director of the Arcadia University Art Gallery, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to school today. <laughs> Today is the first day of classes here at Arcadia, and um, I wish we had better weather because um, often these early events uh, in the semester are accompanied by receptions that occur outside the gallery. And um, it's just a steam bath out there and inside the gallery as well. I should say we have no air conditioning in the gallery, so I'll just apologize once for that. But. Um, Please bear with us, and thank you for, for making your way up here tonight. Um, I really am not a fan of reading biographies, and so the handout that you have basically gives uh, plenty of information about each of our speakers tonight. Um, Co-curators uh, Alex Lambert and Julian Hober, who are both artists, and um, Luke Sant, who you know, is a, a writer. But all three of them are actually similar in, in the sense that their biographies are, are kind of idiosyncratic and unusual. They don't follow the sort of standard paths that um, uh, many biographies do, especially Alex, as I have to say, is, is incredibly unusual. Um, but uh, everyone has a, a really good reason to be sitting here. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll look at the, the bios at some point, um, but I, I wanted basically to sort of avoid spending that time that way and, and focus on, on the conversation that we can have about uh, no bingo for felons, which um, opens shortly after our conversation. We're gonna talk about uh, 40 minutes or so. We hope that there'll be questions from from all of you, because this is a very discursive exhibition. I have to say, I, I've yet to get my mind around all of the, uh, the the subjects and the issues and the questions in the exhibition, which I always think is a great sign of a of a of a good show. I mean, I can barely hold in my mind um, all of the the topics that that are presented, and um, I hope that some of you probably have not. Most of you probably haven't seen the show, which is sort of why we're cycling these slides. Um, the show originated in. Uh, Los Angeles last summer at Blum and Poe Gallery. And uh, um, what we have here, um, the show was actually there, it was called No Person May Carry a Fish into a Bar. And uh, I'll let Julian and Alex talk about that a little bit. But the, um, we changed the title of the exhibition for Arcadia to No Bingo for Felons, which is a, a obsolete law that's still on the books. Uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania, and that's po that points to one way in which um, law and crime and art are complicated by um, text and uh, time. And it just, I just, you know, we we could talk for an hour about just the, the the list of obsolete laws and the sort of poetry and and humor that that they embody. Um, but. Um, uh, Oh, I also want to take this chance to um, mention uh, a great favor that Alex and Julian did in bringing the show here uh, to, to Arcadia. The show in, at, in Los Angeles was much larger. Uh, many roomed gallery is Blum and Poe. We have 1,100 square feet. And they, their intention always was to modify the exhibition and adapt it uh, as it traveled. And um, so the focus on the exhibition here is on on violent crime in cities. And when I first heard that, I was a little uh, taken aback. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more. That the approach to pre presenting this topic here is, uh, uh, I think, um, very smart in that we. It relates to uh, a lot of the material of, about what I consider the, the notion of offstage, and we'll get, get to that shortly. But um, the reason that um, the show is happening now is that uh, Sonia Sotomayor is going to be speaking here on October 22nd. And initially, the show was scheduled to be presented in the spring. And when um, I found out that uh, Chief Justice Sotomayor was going to be here. I wanted to sort of use the show as a way to sort of uh, generate uh, conversations on campus and, and within the city that would address the, the questions of, of crime, law, 
um, the Constitution, and all of those are, are there in the exhibition. Um, so um, before I forget, I want to thank uh, a few people, uh, specifically Matt Borgen, for his help in installing the show, as usual, sort of figuring out things that need to happen for the first time and, um, or at the last minute. And um, uh, we're really pleased with, with how the show uh, displays itself here and uh, couldn't have done it without him, as well as uh, Jamar Nicholas, who's the uh, art gallery assistant, and Juliet Hoffman, who's my curatorial assistant here, doing so much work behind the scenes. So it's, and then a whole army of, of uh, work study students that are, are too many of them to name. So anyway, I, I wanna thank them all, as well as, as you all and our three panelists tonight. So um, I'm gonna start just with a general uh, comment about being a fan of shows, exhibitions curated by artists. Artists curate very differently than, than um, career trained curators do. And uh, so I, I was really happy to learn that um, one of the sort of basic premises of the exhibition has to do with, with the notion of, of rules, which is, of course, is what a law is. And, and maybe, um, Julian, I, this is a chance for you to talk about to somehow something that, that comes from your own practice that ended up sort of being generative in, this, in, the, in the formation of the show. Well, I think this discussion came up this morning. Actually, I was recounting um, something about reading Luke's book, Evidence, years ago. Um, the description of these crime scene photographs uh, as appearing to have a single author and that that appearance of a single author actually came out of uh, a set of procedures given to a number of, a number of people to, for how to make the pictures. And when I read that, I thought about that, that this is very much a sort of conceptual structure for making an image and you could define a look through a set of rules. And so much of the show that we did relates to, and, and the subject of crime's resonance with art is this idea that certain kinds of art is made by breaking rules and certain kinds of art is made by making rules and following them. Certain kinds of procedural, procedural conceptual art are based in uh, you know, setting up a system of rules and following it, whereas there's so much history of modernism that's about transgression and sort of destroying precedent. And that, that that has this resonance with both the law and breaking the law. Do you know what some of those rules are in terms of approaching a crime scene and then photographing the, the scene? Um, yeah. I'm gonna to defer to Luke. <laughs> Um, well, it's it's a code that was established by Alphonse Bertillon, who was uh, the head of um, uh, the identification services for the police department in Paris, beginning in the 1880s. Um, and um, he, um, well, one of his inventions is completely obsolete, which was uh, identifying criminals by the supposedly unique set of measurements in their bodies. So the Bertillon system really referred to measuring, you know, all the joints in the fingers and uh, from the elbow to the shoulder and et cetera. Um, but that was disproved in about 1904 when they found two inmates in Kansas with the same name and the same measurements and who looked almost identical as well. Um, so that's when they switched to fingerprints. But, the, the, but for our purposes, um, Bertillon's um, rules for taking photographs of crime scenes, he was also the pioneer of mug shots, but um, in this case it's crime scenes where you cover a scene in, I forget, it's um, 16 or 32 different segments of, directly overhead, 45 degree angle from the four cardinal points and then from, you know, 10 feet away, 20 feet away, whatever. Um, and there's a way in which um, any crime scene photograph taken according to Bertillot's system looks like any other, but there it stops because some of them actually, the New York pictures don't look like the Paris pictures at all. Um, partly because the New York cops disobeyed the rules, 
but also, I don't know, it's, I've been actually asking myself this question for 20 years now, and I haven't really come up with a perfect answer. And so that the rules actually generate a, a variety of outcomes and in, in, in terms of the, the results that... Well, yeah, I mean, they, um, you know, they're, they're simply common sense, matter of fact rules for getting as much out of, um, you know, getting as much photographic coverage of a place where something happened as possible. Um, but there are a lot of variables in there, especially in the early days when other cops who were not part of the uh, photographing crew would routinely go in and move things around so that the pictures became nonsense as evidence. But also there's lighting conditions, there's space. Some of the, um, the pictures taken in my first book, for example, they couldn't really observe all the um, Bertillon protocol because the rooms were just too small. You could own, the, the room would be, you know, eight feet wide, so you couldn't get the, that, you know, six foot distance from the central point or whatever. That makes me think of um, John Devola's photographs in a way, the um, sort of the, the struggle to work in a small space, the, the, um, the, I mean, what I like about the, his inclusion in the show is the fact that we're, we're dealing with um, an act of, of vandalism initially, as well as a kind of um, an artistic intention that overlaps in ways that are really difficult to, to unravel once, once it gets started. And um, to, to, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, because that, that was really, I think... Um Devola is sort of an interesting figure because he, he begins making photographs at a moment where people are shifting away from taking photographs in the street and more working in the studio. And in a conversation with him, I, I said to him, I said, you know, your work sort of seems to be doing both things. And he said to me, well, I, I wanted to be a studio photographer, but I couldn't afford a studio, so I broke into buildings. And he would break into buildings and make these marks. The, the vandalism that you see, although they're derelict buildings, all of the spray paint marks are his marks. And he makes these photographs that become... You know, they do strange things with space. He's alluding to the history of photography. At, well, not even the history, but the material of photography with using silver and black spray paint. Silver for the nitrate, black for the exposure. And he makes these abstract patterns in the architecture that alters the appearance of the architecture. But you never lose this sense of destruction. Um, and, and this, you never lose this sense of the document, which I think some of the more strictly studio work that happens around the same time or immediately after tries to, you, you sort of lose the idea of the document at a certain point. But the, the, the question about how we read these pictures, I think opens up another thing we could talk about in terms of the way we, and again, in a way you, you talk about this in your, in your essay about um, sort of wanting to move away from this idea of the forensic and the, the sort of in interpretive act and how they, how they collide in terms of, the, maybe you could talk about the well, Rugoff show and how, in a way, distinguish, you could distinguish uh, no person may carry a fish into a bar and no bingo for felons from, from that earlier project of Rugoff. So maybe that... Well, one thing about Davola that's nice is, for this example, is that you know, they do have a, a certain look of, of flatness that we associate with some of the, you know, evidence photographs. But they're very composed, they're very graphic, they're very designed, um, which seems to e exceed that strictly conceptual uh, project. And Rugoff's show called The Scene of the Crime, one of the central propositions of the show is that the methods of forensics, that kind of in, in, interrogative looking could be used to decipher the meaning of certain works of contemporary art. Um, he showed a lot of performance uh, relics as, and would read these sort of, it's sort of, uh, uh, is it 
not, not Greenberg, the other one, Rosenberg, the sort of Harold Rosenberg method, but sort of turned into this forensic reading of the splatter. Um, and for us, it was more interesting to see what kind, you know, in Devola, for example, what kind of excess that can't be reduced to interrogation was also there in the work this design element of Devola, the sort of beauty element of Devola, it's hard to reduce that out when you, when you use these sort of forensic procedures. And that kind of excess for me was always incredibly interesting, that it, it covers both parts and then it, it, has this, it has this inexplainable thing. And, I mean, Alex, correct me if you disagree, but sometimes the show doesn't seem to be perfectly tightly conceptualized. There's certain things that hang off of the edge of the sort of nominally defined purpose of the show, and that's because the sloppiness starts to get very interesting. It, it starts to exceed an idea that you can just articulate as an equation. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I was thinking of the show as a kind of, I mean, any curator is always weaving up a filter of some kind that's not finished. So things pass through the filter and get into the show, but the, the filter's being made as new things come along, right? And there's, so that to some extent, one of the uh, premises of the exhibition that I find really important is the fact that, um, especially as in its manifestation here, is that there's no, we rarely see the, the criminal act being documented. Um, we see residue, we see, um, crime solving, we see the, the sort of, uh, Fra Frank Bender's work is, I think, important to talk about, and members of his family are, are, are here tonight, which is amazing. And um, to, to, to address, in a way, the fact that, um, with few exceptions, the, the crime is, is not depicted, or it, and it's, attempt, it's described, in a way, by, by what's le left over, and there's this notion of, Again, what's off stage, which uh, for me is it was a comforting thing because I, I um, there's actually I'm not really interested in looking at um, blood and guts, um, and I think that was a, a, an intention on your part, and maybe uh, we could talk about that a little bit. Um, I mean, sorry, that would be one thing that I would uh, say for me is was is interesting just in terms of you asking. Uh, relevance to our own work and historically I've done a lot of film and still photography where I where there was a crime scene that I had access to the actual image and didn't want to use it for the reason that you're saying I feel like it um, makes the story or the humanity very inaccessible to look at a maggot riddled body whereas if you look at the place where something happened or the props or whatever you want to call them around what happened that it's uh, our brains are much more able to kind of think about and process and the complexities of something than than just looking at something that's sensational and kind of horrific right the brain sort of shuts down and so curiosity being activated There's, there's one piece in the show that I think is probably the darkest piece in the show in a funny way, which is the Tom Sachs. Is that what you not think I so? I don't think that's the darkest piece in the show. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, I... Do you want to describe it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shotgun that was hand fabricated by Sachs from things he could buy at Home Depot, essentially. And... It's been altered so it won't function, but in design it would be fully functional. And it was a gift to a friend, and it includes four bullets, each one labeled with the names of his family members. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice looking thing. It looks like a toy, it's very playful, but sort of in the middle of that is just like the most kind of brutal destruction. I, it's, it's the darkest in a humorous way, I guess. It doesn't really, it, 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 it hedges on that darkness. All right. I want to know what you think is the darkest piece in the show. I think the darkest piece in the show is the uh, rape film. Oh, the rape yeah. Video. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a depiction of violence that we're oh, actually yeah, I showing. I, I, I haven't forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
That's that's the one that's an over. That's the one that's the most overt depiction in the show. Briefly, just yeah. Um, surprisingly enough, John Lennon and Yoko Ono um, concocted this idea for a film that was a very simple description. I'm not going to quote it exactly right, but something to the effect of a camera crew should follow a woman through a city until they have her cornered and she falls down. And they hire a camera crew and they do it and they corner her well into her apartment. And it's really disturbing. And it's pretty much continuous. You know, there's breaks for changing reels, but, and they never speak to her. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an upsetting thing to watch and it's also very contradictory to whatever we think about John Lennon, certainly, and probably Yoko Ono as well. Right, her, her early work right. was mean, instruction based, but also some of it quite transgressive. Right. So the, the, the subject, the woman being followed, didn't know this was good. She was not a participant. No. Uh, no. Because I was thinking, you know, when I, when I walked into the room and I didn't know what this video was, it made me think of Sophie Kahl. Right. Sure. Where she has herself followed by a detective or she follows some guy. But those are playful compared to that, yeah. I guess. Right, yeah. right. I mean, yeah. And there's this sort of famous Vito Acconci piece, and this is, as, as you noted, Richard, even more upsetting than that. And the Acconci piece famously resulted in the changing of laws in New York City about stalking. Oh, that. oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the Acconci piece, which we've, we've talked about putting in the show several times, but I think, I think either MoMA or the Whitney owns it, so it's a little tough to get our paws on. <laughs> Um, I wondered, uh, having done the show twice now, and I know, Luke, you didn't see the first show, and you, know, you barely had a chance to look at this one, um, but the, the shows are, are radically different in a way. I mean, we're seeing some images of the, of the exhibition in um, Los Angeles, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the ways in which you took something that was much bigger and sort of narrowed it down for, for, for presentation here. And that in a way to have a, to, to, to the chance to recurate a show is something that, I, you know, is, a, is an interesting opportunity. And, um, and uh, you know, correct me if <laughs> this is wrong. But I mean, I think from the beginning we talked a lot about um, wanting to have, like, it is such a big subject that, so um, I don't know if I would, if it's recurating or if it's like this continuum, because we've been talking a lot about the next iterations which we have thought out and which would be very unrecognizable from, from these. And so, um, so I think that's something we've been excited about from the beginning. And it was just exciting to have you know, the second one happen. And, but um, I, don't know. I don't know if it's, a re, if it's a recurating or if it's like an opportunity to focus in on something, some aspect of that original. Yeah, it's really it's really like honing in on, you know, one aspect. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to doing the version of the show that's about forgery and the version of the show that's about, cri about, that. about Crime Stoppers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, cause we could have done a whole show about people who fight crime through art production, you know, which would include some of the forensic stuff and would include Bender, but would also include a bunch of Mel Chin's interventionist work, would include Suzanne Lacey's In Mourning and Enrage. Um, and all of the forgery works that were in uh, Blum and Poe are not in this, and we would like to do an expanded forgery exhibition. Is it possible that crime could be more interesting than art? Um, you're asking me that at a, at a moment where I, I think most things are more interesting than art. Um, but, but yeah, sure, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of taboos left in art, right? And that's always interesting, and there's plenty left in crime. That's all it is, in a way, right? It's, it's, it's like there's very little transgression that you can actually achieve in art at this point without almost extracting yourself from it. Um, and, you know, I think, I think for me, part of the, 
part of the fun of this show, of putting the show together, is you're still looking for these spots where you have friction, right? You're still looking for these spots where, like, maybe that can, like, uh, disorient someone a little bit in a way where you get, you know, the Gregory Green Bible bomb that keeps coming by. That, you know, that piece, you know, trips people up. Right, it looks, and we had we had to put a sign in the gallery of and Poe that says, "There are no real bombs in this show," right? And Gregory actually told us that if you don't do that, the appearance of the bomb, even if it's not a real bomb, is an act of terrorism. Which he learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, which he learned the hard way. <laughs> um, did he? Was he arrested? He's been. In he was. Can can I say this? Yeah. He, he well, no, but about oh, the. Oh, he says it. Yeah. He was on the FBI's, there, there's a piece in this show that is a nuclear device, and it's a perfectly constructed nuclear device, except the plutonium is replaced with a baseball. And, and he's made a number of uh, Bible bombs and rockets, and I think the first show he did, he synthesized a couple quarts of LSD and put them in glass jars, as pre presented them as sculptures, and was arrested. But he was on the FBI's suspect list for the Unabomber at one point which he seems a little proud of, which is great. Yeah. Oh, tons of people were on that list. That's <laughs> <laughs> nothing yeah. special. So, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that's, 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 makes it pretty good. That makes it pretty interesting. Um, but the, uh, but his story about when he learned this thing about having to state that there was no explosives was when the basement flooded at the gallery and the, uh, firemen came in and saw all of this bombs and weapons and called the police <coughs> because they were afraid. So you have to label that it's not, that this is art and that it was like, that, that, that breaks the law. And shipping these things is always interesting. <laughs> yeah. We do have a collection of emails we'd like to publish for the catalog. I was interested in, in one thing you said about the Devola that you, it was almost like you eventually bumped back into art again though. I mean, as much as we like, might love crime and how interesting crime is, none of this would really be possible without the, the sort of permission that, that art provides. And, um, I, but I bumped back into that with Bender more than okay. almost anything else. Um, and. You know, I, this may be because I was a student of Mike Kelly's and his uh, continuing investigation of the uncanny, but, you know, I, I'd put Bender up against any number of very successful contemporary sculptors for producing these, you know, there's things even if you don't know the stories behind them, if you don't know how he got there, if you don't know the, the sort of combination of science and what seems almost like psychic uh, interpretation of... Is that, that's, is that Bender? <laughs> that okay. the yeah. one showed it. Right. That, that even if you don't have that information, these things have resonance as objects, uh, representations that... And, and what Luke... Oh, I don't... It's terrible to quote you. But, <laughs> but what you were saying earlier about uh, some of the crime scene photography allows uh, you know allows for the documentation of spaces that would never otherwise have been photographed that there is something in crime that demands representation right there's always these things in in forensics that demand representation and you know what art is is pretty loose right and anytime we have a picture we're kind of there already you know i i find that excess in the bender and in, you know, I would pour through books of crime scene photographs for years because it just, oh, those pictures are really good pictures. They're really interesting pictures in a way that sometimes like, you know, a Salgado photograph isn't, you know. And, the, but let's push that. They're interesting because of the, the transgression or the, I mean, I mean, in a way, I, I, I mean, I spent, a long time geeking out about the way film grain and flash photography signifies truth, 
and this is something picked up by Terry Richardson. And, you know, there's a kind of semiotics in the photographic image that you just, it's always there, right? And what can be interesting about the crime scene photograph isn't even about transgression, but how it communicates in a very complex way. That, that seems like a much more complex way of communicating than the, the Salgado, for example, which seems to be telling you everything you already know. Maybe, Luke, you could talk a little bit about that, because you have actually an extensive collection. Uh, we're lucky to have the four pictures you loaned to the show, but I, I, you, this is an ongoing interest for you, and it, it doesn't seem to be waning. I mean, it's... Um, <laughs> um, oh. Um, actually, what, what I was thinking of was, well, you know, I, I mentioned my book, Evidence. When I named that book, I was um, shamefully ignorant of the fact that there was a previous book, also called Evidence, uh, put together by Larry Sultan and Mike Mandel in um, the 1970s, 1980s. They had unbelievable access to all kinds of, the, the photo archives of, public institutions in the state of California, but also major corporations like Bechtel. I mean, places you wouldn't think would allow a couple of arty photographers in to just look at their photo files. But they went through looking for the strangest pictures they could find and came out with this book, which is truly remarkable. If you're not familiar with it, I urge you to seek it out. Um, they, because the pictures they found um, are interesting, well, in quite a number of ways, really. They were taken for all kinds of reasons. There are all kinds of, they're usually tests. You know, there'll be tests of um, construction materials or tests of cars or, you know, I mean, tests of all kinds of materials in all kinds of ways, in greater or lesser degrees of artificiality. So there's sometimes there are grids involved. Sometimes they look like they're some part of a crime investigation or whatever, where in fact it has nothing to do with crime. But um, so they're, they're fascinating in the way that um, something that was, pictures that were taken for one purpose, divorced from that context, look like art. And what's even more striking today when you look at this book is that they look like conceptual art of the 1970s and 80s when Mandel and Sultan were looking at these pictures and putting, assembling this collection. Um, they really take on, they, they have that substance of their time. It reminds me of um, the um, illustration in a book by the anthropologist Edmund Carpenter where he shows you a Chinese pagoda built in Munich in the 1880s that was, at, to everybody who saw it in Munich in the 1880s, looked like a Chinese pagoda, and now looks like a German 1880s interpretation of a Chinese pagoda. So, in the same way, these, these photographs, the selection made um, enlarges them twice over. They, they're art, but they're also very specific art of a certain time and place. Um, there's a fascination in general with pictures that were taken, uh, photographs that were taken for reasons that had nothing to do with art, where the art, so that there is an artistic quality that's brought to it by whoever looks at it. The pictures that Mandel and Sultan collected didn't look like art to the people who made them, probably not to the first or six layers of people who saw them, because you had to have a background. You had to have been informed by art photography, by the photography attached to conceptual art, etc. So as we've become more sophisticated in our knowledge of photography and its uses and its history, so we could look at photo photographs from a wide range of purposes, a wide, made over a wide range of time, and see them as art, where nobody connected with their making would have. And, you know, this is like sort of a sort of answer to the conundrum of, you know, my six-year-old child can paint as well as that, or, you know, a chimpanzee can do it. Well, the fact is that, um, you know, we know what the answer would have been back then, but photography brings a kind of objective layer to this, um, where, you know, there's so many, there's such a vast and rich body of photography, especially photography made before innocence was lost, let's say around 1980. 
Um, you mean the digital? Or well, no, I don't mean digital. I mean a certain kind of um, self-knowledge about photography, because 1980 is really when museums started having separate f departments of photographs, for example, when photographs, um, you know, before 1980, you could buy um, you could buy an AJ for a hundred bucks. I mean, it was like there was no market. That's what I mean by loss of innocence. And it's, you know, it's this whole process of education which had happened with alarming speed. And so these crime scene photographs I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, I'm not fascinated by them because they show disgusting things as some crime scene photographs do, you know, exploded bodies, severed limbs. I'm, I don't care about that. I'd rather see pictures of a room, um, and that's the, the four pictures that are, I have a, that are from my collection made before my birth that are not my pictures. Um, in the show, that's what they're all about. They're about um, these rooms in working class apartments in Brooklyn in the 1930s. Uh, well, three apartments, one bar. They would not have been taken for any other purpose than a crime scene investigation. And probably there's fairly small chance any of these pictures, places would have been photographed at all, except in the context of a crime scene investigation, at most maybe an insurance investigation. Um, so, um, and then at the same time, these are so much more interesting. Um, these and their cousins, uh, made for other non-artistic purposes, are so much more interesting than at least 90 to 95% of the pictures that were being made as art, which all followed really stifling rules. They were all moonlight in Vermont, every last one of them, and if not literally that, then, you know, metaphorically. Um, so it wouldn't have occurred to our photographers, or most of them, to take a picture of a scuffed linoleum floor. Now people are, you know, there are probably 80 specialists listed in the directory who, you know, specialize in scuffed linoleum floors, but innocence has been lost, as I say. So does this have something maybe to do with the, the anonymous nature of those pictures and the intention that is twisted by the, the viewer or, or by history or, I mean that, that... Well, the fact that they're anonymous is, is kind of beside the point. I mean, um, we, you know, I don't know the names of these photographers, but if we did, wouldn't change anything that much. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's twisted. I don't, wouldn't say the intent is twisted. It had an intent. But then, so did um, you know a lot of classic painting. A lot of classic painting was meant for devotional purposes, as well as to you know um, pay tribute to the donors who made possible the lifestyle of the painter who made etc. And you know I, we don't really care about that stuff anymore so much. Um, now it's about the painting. Um, so was that twisted? In the same way, um, they were taken for certain investigative procedures which are past anyone's recall. Nobody's left alive who had anything to do with these pictures. Um, there may not even be any written record of the cases left in existence. Um, but we have these pictures and they have their own life, they have their own meaning, and it's a meaning that keeps evolving. And it's, it's not stable, you know. It's, um, and I think that's the great thing about art is that meaning in general in art is not a fixed thing. I love, I know there's so many of you here, I'm hoping that um, there are some questions, does that make sense to sort of, uh, and again, I, I know that mo most of you have not seen the show, which we'll see momentarily, but um, I'm hoping that there may be some questions for uh, Luke or the, the curators. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm open to all rooms, really. But <laughs> I like rooms. I like rooms with a certain patina to them. You know, I like rooms that have been lived in. Yeah. Much more interesting than your model house. You know. Question. So, so my nature is to sit here and try and to think of a crime that doesn't do that. But I can't. And I think it's a really wonderfully articulated explanation of a, a connection between crime and sculptural concerns, actually. Um, Corey Newkirk's piece in the show, uh, there's an image of it that, that comes up a bit, which is these newspaper photographs with the police line that runs through all of them. Um, that piece is called Long Division. And, you know, he's obviously making a pun both about a police division, but also about the way space is divided by that line. And, you know, yeah, what's, what's yours and what's someone else's is, is sort of at the center of a lot of these pieces. I think you articulated it beautifully. Um, yeah, I guess it would have to be uh, I, a crime, a physical crime, is something that occurs in a very specific place. Um, I guess the, 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 the exception would be a thought crime. Um, you know, because I think even, I was just thinking like train robberies, they take place like, you know, in, um, on a line, but still it's going to occur in a pinpointed location. Yeah, it's uh, so it's not it's not an art of the landscape. Yeah. That's the Cory Newkirk. That. Rosella. Yeah, that's. That is Frank, that's a piece by Frank Bender. Um, there's a, a different piece by Frank Bender in the show here. Uh, that w is Rosella Atkinson. And yeah, the, the, that sculpture is actually in Philadelphia. It's at the Mutter Museum. It's in the Mutter Museum's collection. Um, Frank Bender was a forensic artist uh, and probably the greatest forensic artist ever. Uh, he, his family is here. Um, and Frank reconstructed uh, these images of people from unidentifiable remains from crimes and crime scenes. This one in particular that was that that's coming across on the slides, um, a teenage girl, early teenage girl, uh, and they he did this reconstruction and he did this kind of amazing facial expression and the haircut and uh, I think I believe it was Rosella's aunt saw the bust at the Mutter Museum and identified her and the 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 thing that you see on the wall behind is a newspaper clipping that has a picture of the bust and the picture that the, that the woman who identified Rosella had of Rosella with the same exact facial expression. And hairstyle. And hairstyle. And there's something about what 
Frank managed to do that's, you know, about measuring, about science, about understanding anatomy. And then there's a whole other level of it that there's no way to explain except like he could commune with these remains and, and know something that, that I, I have no comprehension of how he could know. But he did it pretty consistently. And no one taught him how to do it. Yeah, yeah, there, there was no training. And in fact, I mean, to some extent, he kind of invented it. Yeah. The one that is in the show here is Anna Duval, and it was actually his first reconstruction that he ever did, which it's, it's to me, it's a very magical thing to have here. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Frank a, a few years back, and and going to the house and seeing a bunch of this stuff and it's really it's really impressive really something Thank you. And that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that Anna Duval was so, she was shot in the head and they said to your father, we, we have no idea what she looked like. And he said, I know what she looks like. She was shot in the head several times, so she was not recognizable at all. Any other questions? Like you have a question or <laughs> something else to say. <laughs> Missing pieces, or is, um, is there any aspect of crime <laughs> that you feel like you haven't covered in, in, in oh, either show? Millions. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, what's the, what's on your wish list? What do you wish you had? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a show that we've been bouncing back and forth ideas in emails, which is. In, in this version in Los Angeles, uh, there was a section that was about forgery where we got this really nice thing in motion where we had, there's, there's a lot of disputes about the authenticity of certain works of Andy Warhol. And there was a bunch of Brillo boxes that were um, apparently fabricated by a very esteemed museum director who you know, after retiring, produced a bunch of Warhol boxes and sold them for a ton of money. And we showed a Warhol Brillo box that was a copy of the same ones that these counterfeit ones were, these forgeries were copies of, except it was, it was done by an artist named Mike Bidlow and is an appropriation work and not a forgery. It's a Mike Bidlow work that's an exact copy of a Warhol that is the same Warhol that was copied by Pontus Holton <laughs> as a forgery. Um, and so the whole thing sort of goes off the rails. And then to just add to it, we had a second Brillo box, which is slightly smaller, made by a guy whose name I'm not supposed to say, who was a member of the factory and left the factory with screens and got permission from someone at the factory to make a few for him and his friends, but they weren't real ones. So here was a guy who had made 
Brillo boxes for Warhol at the factory and had Warhol's screens and is making Brillo boxes that are not real ones. But, and, and, and you can't count them as any, you know, you can't, they have no value, except they look like Warhol Brillo boxes. And they're the same fucking thing. Yeah, they're the same thing. And, and so we had those two side by side. And then we had a Modigliani painting and a Renoir painting, a Renoir pastel, that were both done by Elmir de Hori, who is the subject of Orson Welles' documentary, F for Fake, who is this world-renowned art forger. And at the opening, the artist Pierre Bismuth showed up and asked us if they were real Elmires. Because <laughs> those became valuable over other faked. His and forgeries he, are yeah, more valuable Yeah, there's forgeries of Elmires, forgeries. right. And, and I, said, I, I said, Pierre, how, do you, how does one tell if it's a real Pierre Bismuth, or a, a real uh, Elmire? He says, well, you hire the Modigliani expert, and if they can't tell that it's not a Modigliani, it's an Elmire. <laughs> so this is this is the subject of the show we we have been talking about most. Um, there have been lots of new forgery cases just in the past uh, <coughs> couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah. The past been, few months, it's yeah. been a bevy so of things. Find that Queens guy. I, I've always wanted to look into uh, the fact that uh, you know um, uh, Marcel Maria, who was this Belgian surrealist, was close friends with Magritte, claims that he and Magritte lived basically in the 1940s when there was no art market, everybody was broke, they lived through making forgeries. Um, so they're presumably somewhere out there in European country houses, these <laughs> forgeries that are real Magritte's. Um, w one of the things that, it, it's sort of like a weird art market secret that I like very much that we've talked about for this show is um, many of the very big, very high-powered galleries will produce copies of works of art that they ha by the artists that they represent. Um, and a friend of mine who worked for a gallery in Los Angeles had an Ed Ruscha in her house. And I said, how do you have this Ed Ruscha? She goes, oh, it's, it's a dummy. I said, how can that be? She says, no, no, we make dummies to take over to collectors' houses and hang in their homes to see if they like it enough to buy it. So there's this whole raft of fake artworks produced by the galleries as devices for selling. And it's, you know, it's, this is just one more level of it, and then you have the appropriation level, and it's just sort of endless. Or no, not you. <laughs> so we'd like to talk to you. <laughs> um, there's a there's a Katie Noland piece that. Went, went, came up for auction, and she decided it wasn't a Katie Nolan piece anymore. When it went up for auction, someone had paid a bunch of money for it. And she said it was damaged in a way that invalidated it, but suddenly, like, there's no value to the thing whatsoever. I'd like to get that piece, the invalidated Katie Nolan piece. I think that would be, that would be a score. And I'd like to get someone to paint a forgery of one of the Richard Prince. Oh, well, I can do that. <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, one more question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. The toughest question of the night. Um, so it's a symbolic crime, right? And he's destroying the law as it stands in a certain way. Um, 
we thought that we thought that if we were going to have an act of transgression visible in the show, that was a good one as opposed to like a mangled body, right? And the act of disrespect for the law, um, you know, is is interesting in the context of the rest of the show. Uh, it's a particularly <coughs> loaded image. I mean, if you, I mean, just based on the guy's name, the na he, he spells it D-R-E-A-D, but the relationship to the Dred Scott versus Sanford case, which said that African Americans had no standing as citizens, um, there's ample reason to burn the Constitution. Um, and, you know, we wanted to make a nod to this idea that the law, which we understand as somehow the right thing, is sometimes absolutely not the right thing, right? This, this idea of what, um, what the rules are and what it means to break the rules. I mean, and, and it has, there are other works in the show that do this as well, but the idea of that sometimes breaking the rule is the only right thing. And I think that's the place that that piece occupies in the show. I also think if you're talking about... Well, I, I was just going to add that if you're talking about cities, that we had, we had discussed the recent like gutting of certain constitution of, of, of you know the Voter Rights Act and certain human civil rights that are being um, kind of re-upped for conversation in a really horrific way, in my opinion, and and that does affect, I think, certainly voting is, a, you know. A, Something there that's being curtailed, um, kind of rapaciously. Do you, do you... On that note, um, I think we should go look at the show, and uh, there's uh, lots of refreshments. So um, uh, thank you. Um, of course. Luke and uh, Alex and Julian will be around for a while. I hope you, you'll talk to them. And um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, how about a round of applause for? The gallery, in case if you, if you haven't been there before, it's just across, just to the, it's the building with the smokestack.